morning and thank you all for joining us today. Um, I've got 10 minutes to talk about what's happening in the US economy and I'm very lucky to be joined by um, two gentlemen who are rightly positioned to do so. So there is a, a growing concern about um, that the largest economy in the world could be on the verge of a recession. That is literally two years and a half after the last one. Um, during this conference, uh, we have discussed so many headwinds and challenges um, that the world is facing now. And I think on the top of the list is the slowdown in the, ch in the American um, economy. Definitely the fiscal uh, policy, the tightening uh, fiscal poli policy of the Fed and the high inflation rate. And of course, the long term impact on the rest of the world. So uh, let me introduce my panelists first. Frank Bruno is the uh, CEO of Cerberus uh, Capital Management and Joshua Friedman is the co-founder of Canyon Partners. Thank you gentlemen for coming along. Thank and you. let me start Joshua with the first question that, that probably on everyone's mind nowadays. How hard and how long the, the feds will be able to keep the foot on the brake? It's a good question, Lubna, and it's hard for any of us to project human behavior. But I would say uh, I don't think the Fed, the Fed chair has a great deal of confidence in the data that he gets from his staff because he missed inflation so badly. Either that or he doesn't trust the analysis of that data. But either way, I think the Fed has to be able to see the whites of their eyes before he takes his foot off the brake. And that means he has to see actual easing of inflation. Now, one of the problems I see is I think that uh, market analysts and in the popular press focus just on the Fed. The inflation isn't just because the Fed didn't have its foot on the brake earlier. It's also because of wanton spending by the Treasury. And the Fed can't really do anything about the lingering effects of that incredible amount of spending that took the U.S. debt up as extremely as it did. So I, I think the Fed is likely to probably oversteer um, I think they're doing it from an economy that is relatively strong with extremely low unemployment and extremely healthy banking system. So I, I don't necess see this, necessarily see that as a defining moment that's going to throw us back to 15% unemployment of 2020 or 10% or 11% unemployment of 2008. It's just the Fed is trying very hard to make very pessimistic announcements about inflation to get consumers to do the work for it. In other words, if consumers pull back their spending, if companies pull back their hiring, then the Fed doesn't have to be on the break for quite as long. So they're hoping they can jawbone the market into doing some of that work. Um, I, I will go back to the point uh, you raised about the uh, recession. But before that, uh, do you agree with Joshua that to cure inflation, it's not only the um, uh, job of the Fed? It has to be probably partnering up with a proper uh, fiscal and uh, uh, policy, and as he said, probably the markets can help as well? Yes, I, I think um, if you look at 08, 09, the fiscal plus monetary response was about 20% of GDP. If you look at the 2021 response, fiscal plus monetary was 60% of GDP, completely beyond what was required. So I think um, we're paying that bill now uh, with very high inflation. We're, we see through a few hundred companies we're exposed through through credit and private equity. So, and so you think it was a poor management by the government? I think it was an overreaction. Um, I mean, in the very early days of COVID, none of us knew how bad COVID would actually be, so it required an emergency type response. But um, even after we had data suggesting COVID was going to be manageable, there was far too much um, follow-on fiscal and sustained monetary. And, and I think that that's why we are where we are in a difficult spot. Um, over the weekend, there were whispers that there could be a potential moderation uh, in the tightening. What would actually push the Fed to pivot? I think um, having made the mistake they've, they made, they'll need to um, take rates up um, five probably 5% zone, but keep them there. The market is like uh, the dog ringing the bell wants some more, wanting some more fed uh, food. And, uh, and, and I think this time um, the market's gonna be frustrated by a sustained period of, of higher rates. A lot of credit was very poorly originated in that um, 
uh, era of, of a monetary excess, and I think a lot of bills will be paid with, uh, with, with credit failing. Joshua. I would just add to that, and, I, and I, by the way, I think that's probably just behaviorally, if you look at human nature, I think the idea of taking it up to a level and, and keeping it there for a while and seeing what happens is important. Um, I'm not sure that taking inflation down to the target rates that they have, even if they're above the old two and a half number, um, is necessarily the best idea. When you have an unsustainable amount of debt that you've taken on at the federal government, in addition to unsustainable amounts of debt at state governments, um, to some extent, the easiest way to get rid of that debt is to inflate your way out of it as opposed to tax your way out of it. Um, it also leaves much longer term effects. You're asking about the effect of that on a recession. There is a longer term uh, sort of uh, what I would call a, a, a stagflationary type of effect that's determined because when the government's carrying as much debt as they're carrying and rates are as high as they are, they don't have a lot of money left in the till for other things. So you won't be able to have the same kind of stimulative federal spending that you've had in the past. Um, you asked a bit of why did they do that. Well, part of it was the immediate crisis, and part of it is that politicians in the U.S. are enormously short-term in their outlook. They well, have is to it get fair for the next administration? Uh, it's, well, the they, it's the reality of it. People have to get reelected. So if you have a crisis, they'll spend all the money they can and let it become somebody else's problem. Well, now we've got a lot of somebody else's problem, and it's going to linger with us, in my opinion, for quite some time. Can we avoid a recession in the U.S.? I don't think so. I think we're headed in, into a recession. And I think uh, one of the concerns this time is China has a big property market problem, much slower growth. Um, Europe has a combination of, of, of uh, demographics, you know, a shrinking population and enormous debt load. So will require a great deal of finesse to navigate through. I think they go into a deeper recession. Well, so it's the combined recessions that I think could, could well, make it more difficult. What shape will that recession take, in your opinion? V shape, W, U? I think this one is m more likely to be like an early 80s recession, a, a longer recession um, than the the V shape that the market has gotten very used to. Joshua? Yeah, I don't think it's, it's going to be nearly as severe as some are projecting because I think we're starting from such a position of strength. We have a banking system that has less leverage than it's had in decades. We have consumers who are in better shape than they have been in decades in terms of 3.5% unemployment as opposed to the kind of numbers we've seen in the past and in terms of their savings relative to their wages. So I think that what you will have is an inflationary environment and by the way, maybe that's not so bad for the longer term picture of how big a burden in real dollars the government has to bear. Why? And maybe it's not so bad if inflation addresses maybe the a misallocation of capital toward capital as opposed to toward labor, because maybe it rectifies that a bit. But it also, inflation is sort of a cruel master in that it affects some businesses quite differentially from others. You know, real estate right in the target yes. uh, because of cap rates. Um, consumers in certain specific areas if it comes through things like energy, et cetera. And Europe also did something else, which is they made themselves super dependent on Russia, and then you had something, kind of a bolt from left field. And I think because of technology and because of information and because of the internet, they became very much just in time reliant on things from China that aren't necessarily gonna show up just in time. So we have a vulnerable system globally. I think Frank correctly points out the, the complexity when you have multiple, inf multiple recessions of different magnitudes taking place at the same time, and particularly at the same time as China seems to be maybe taking a little bit of a step back mm -hmm. from the world. Joshua, um, an honest question. Do you think really what the Fed is doing is actually cold tightening? Don't you think the policy now is very accommodative? I, I think they need to do it right now because they erred so badly in the past. But in terms of, uh, but, but I think it's a bit crude. I, they, they say they're going to be very data dependent. They can't be data dependent on the kind of data they were looking at in the past. And I think they can't do the job themselves. And I think the targets they have may be inappropriate. So um, I'm in a kind of a wait and see in terms of my confidence in, in the Fed leadership. How far the um, Fed can go in order to slow the demand and probably not cure completely the inflation, but at least bring it down a bit? Well, there's been a lot of discussion that historically, uh, when you have inflation as high as we have it now, typically the Fed funds rate has to exceed the in inflation rate and stay up there for a while. 
I think that um, uh, that's possible that will be required. So I, I think we're, we're going to be in for a, a difficult um, market, a set of market conditions for, for a couple of years as a result. I, I'd add one point to Frank's, which I think core inflation is quite a bit lower than these headlines in the sense of non-transitory part of it. If you eliminate some of the supply chain, you're probably closer to five or five and a half percent today. But still, that's, that's a pretty high number. It's, it's very far from the 2% target. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the credit markets. Where do you think they're heading? Sorry, which markets? The credit markets. Oh, the credit markets. Well, I think the credit markets in many ways anticipate other markets. Um, people talk about high yield spreads being only 550 basis points, although off a lot higher uh, base than they were and therefore have potential to expand. Maybe. Um, I think that's probably true, but I also don't think that that number is really indicative of where things are trading. Where trades are taking place, they're taking place much, much wider. So I think the adjustment that's already taken place is quite enormous in certain areas. Um, credit markets tend to be less liquid and more technical in some ways. We had, uh, we had a decade of inflows into mutual funds that produced buying. Buying produced prices that went up. Prices produced more buying. That virtuous cycle is now a vicious cycle and money's been redeemed from high yield mutual funds, causing selling, causing prices to go down and so forth. So uh, we aren't at the point of seeing great, dis great new distressed opportunities yet, but we are at the point where there are many, many, many more distressed pricings of actually pretty good credits. And I guess I would say if you look at the upside versus the downside of uh, buying certain credit securities versus buying equity securities, I, I would say, um, you have less downside and more upside today off uh, 80 cent price debt than you do off average equity prices, given what the Fed's likely to do. Um, there's two more questions that I would like to um, ask before, because I think we're running out of time. But two things. One, uh, dollar dominance. Do you think we will see a different currency as the reserve currency of the world, or it's, it's going to stay forever? And why? I don't know about forever, but I would, wouldn't say um, anytime soon for, main, you know, for lack of alternatives. Uh, I don't think the euro, um, the euro has many issues. The yen has many issues. Uh, China's currency doesn't float. So, uh, so you don't I think see an alternative. I, I, I don't see an alternative. And, and I also think US, the US, a lot of people are writing about the problems, but top 50 market cap companies in the world, 36 are in the United States, three are in China. So I think, I think there's a long way to go before we run out of uh, innovative power and the, and the dollar retains, uh, remains as the global reserve currency for lack of an alternative. The pound looks bad, the yen looks bad, um, China's looking inward, uh, crypto hasn't looked so great as a store of value uh, lately and is highly volatile, so I, I agree there's no alternative. On the other hand, um, inflation is a way of eroding the value of the dollar. That's the adjustment mechanism. Mm -hmm. Will China be able to surpass uh, the U.S. and become the world economic engine and the largest economy of the world? Last question, because he's telling me time is up. Uh, I, I don't know when that happens or how it happens. They've got an enormous population, a huge inventory of technological skills, but they also have a system that isn't necessarily designed to elicit those skills in economically efficient ways and to lead the world in them. And they appear to be pointing more inward these days than outward. So, so maybe that means that the time frame for those types of issues is much longer. Um, if people want a safe haven for their capital, they're still seeking the U.S. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a, an, just an enormous asset that the U.S. should be very, very careful not to squander. So yes, no? So I would say not in the immediate future. I would agree with that. You have to be a magnet for global talent to be the leading economy. And, and I think um, uh, China is not, not that today. So the answer is no. Thank you very much, uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, for sharing your experience and thoughts. Let's give them a, um, a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you.